Um, the first and most important is about the history of anthropology, which is about really why I went into anthropology and what I want to say anthropology is about, which is a little bit different from the way in which I generally hear people talking about anthropology. So I do accept the canon as to what anthropology is, but I do see a, a different way. So I was talking about what was happening in the late 19th century, and I mentioned that um, that um, um, we had the end of the biblical time and the beginning of the ethnological time with the uh, with the discoveries in Britain about the relation about relations of animals from before the flood with the uh, with the artifacts, human artifacts, and so the beginning of the of the um, of the 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 bringing human beings into geological time if you will um the impact of that i think along with darwin was really really tremendous before that if you wanted to look at the politics of relations between non-western peoples and uh colonists particularly in English-speaking world, because I don't so much know about the French-speaking world. Um, the Everything was framed in a biblical argument sense. And the question was always, it started with Condorcet, if you, way back in that the end of the 18th century, who said, of course, we know these people are well behind, behind us. The question is whether some of them can be rescued or, and some of them will probably die off, and we have to figure out which ones. And he said, some are more advanced and some are less advanced. Okay. In the 19th century, so long as humanity was in biblical time, no matter how far back the most primitive were, we were here only for... 4,000 years after the flood, because everyone agreed that the flood was the beginning of the modern era of human beings. With these discoveries in Britain, the, as Troutman puts it, the bottom fell out of time. And so we ended up with a first stage now of human history, where instead of it being no longer than 4,000 years, it was now 60,000 years. And this led a lot of people who we would call racists today, and I think I would call them racists then, to decide that a whole bunch of humanity was beyond rescuing because they were so far behind. Or they could only be rescued if we disciplined them into changing. Um, and... Morgan, ancient society, was the beginning of a presumption that there was a science to this analysis because he put time periods on all these ages. And he said the most primitive were 60,000 years in that stage. And he ends up with this remarkable statement. I don't think we read ancient society anymore, so we don't know this. This is what this remarkable statement that says only two peoples actually have achieved civilization, the Semites and the Aryans, but only the Aryans have really done it. And then given how far back everything was and how quickly things changed, it could only have been with God's intervention that we could have become civilized. 5,000 years ago. And that gave all kinds of justification, presumably scientific justification, for colonial practices, which led to what happened in Africa 
I mean, I'm not saying and not in the material sense, of course, there are other reasons, but the justification for it as being an okay thing came from Morgan. So the biblical side of the argument, which said, well, we're all the same, we're all humans, we're, no one's so far behind that they can't figure it out and work it out, that argument got lost because biblical time got lost. Boaz, we learn that Boaz's contribution was that he told Morgan, you can't be an armchair anthropologist. You have to go out and do field work. That, and then you'll find that things are different. And we think of then ethnography and all of that as the beginning of a scientific kind of anthropology. But I would like us to look at anthropology instead as being a sustained argument against colonialism, against the science of colonialism. And that Boaz's argument was not, was methodological, go out and find out what's going on, but why? Because then you will see how wrong Morgan's position on the standing of these people as human beings equal to you and I is. So it, be, it became an anti-colonial argument. So I think anthropology was founded on trying to work out arguments against colonialism. And then what happened in this period, this more recent period, which I happened after what I is known as the reflexive moment, is that people like Boaz got re- imagined in the most negative kinds of ways. So he said, I want to find out what quack, quack, quack people are like. And he didn't put in anything about Western culture in there. This got read as he didn't understand that there was colonialism. He tried to pretend there was no impact of colonialism. I don't think so. I think that his argument was, look at the integrity of these cultures, that they exist in themselves without the need for Western goods. He was absolutely against colonialism, but he felt, and a lot of those people felt, that this was an effective argument. And that was what was lost and needs to be recovered because right now they say that it's said that Boaz's work was um, about making little ethnographies of dying peoples, peoples who are dying off. Now, I'm not sure that he wasn't worried that that was going to happen, but that isn't why he did it. And there's a whole movement in the United States called the progressive movement, which is not at all recognized as being foundational to anthropology. But there was a lot of work done in the 20s and in the 30s and in the 40s and maybe even earlier that was about showing that common people had culture, had in ways that were um, that were valid, that were that were to be celebrated and not poor trash to be put on the side or to be moved forward, advanced, urbanized, whatever. And you think of, uh, uh, there's a book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men by Alby. There are uh, Dorothea Lange's photographs. There's my father's work with all of these uh, musicians, black musicians, uh, musicians from southern part of the United States. There, goal was not to say, let's preserve this culture, but let's show these arrogant people who think that these cultures are worthless just how valuable and important they are. Now, I'm not exactly sure that's the political argument I would have used. I probably, today, I wouldn't use that argument. I'm not sure the argument I would have used in those days, but maybe I wouldn't have used that same argument. But I certainly would never have accused those people of being on the side of some colonial domination of other peoples, which is the way it's been read. And I think that's become really twisted in the way in which we recount the history of the discipline today. 
And so I just want to say, I think if we taught the beginning of the different discipline in those terms that I've just talked about, it would do a great service to giving us the confidence to say we can intervene in what's going on in the world today, not have to stand aside because of our bad colonial past, but we have been trying our best and probably the only discipline that really did try this through this whole period of, of great colonial expansion. Okay, now we get to Canada. So when I came to Canada, and there, you know, the generation that you're talking about in English Canada, maybe in French Canada too, I mean, Saladin's one, I don't, just don't know how many, we weren't trained here. Many of us were trained in the United States, or, and were Americans, and I was American. Um, and I need to say this too, that I, when I gave my testimony at the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline hearings, I became a Canadian citizen because I felt that I was testifying in terms of being a Canadian as much as being an anthropologist, and I didn't feel it was right to distance myself from, from the politics of what was going on. So, um, so the... So we, we, were, we were trained somewhere else. At the time I was trained, and I'm a little bit older than the baby boomers, the kind of message that I'm telling you right now about the history of the discipline would not have seemed very strange to people I was talking to. It's only people who came after who really re revised this history. When we came here, there were a bunch of people like me. Harvey was kind of like me. I mean, I can just name a bunch of people. Sally Weaver, who was trained here and was Canadian, was like me. We, we had a really big role to play at the beginning of the professionalization of anthropology in the 60s and 70s, I think. I mean, we, were, we were pretty well. We were political. But there, there's not a question about it, and we were engaged in indigenous issues, and we asked ourselves what anthropology might be able to do to make a contribution to changing relations in this country with indigenous peoples. That was very, very central. There were arguments that went on throughout the early 70s about the Canadianization of anthropology and who he would hire, and whether anthropology, could you have a national form of anthropology, or, well, the argu we lost the argument. They said there is no national form of, of a discipline, it's, it's an international thing. The consequence is that it's in a very American kind of discipline here. It, and in fact, some of my colleagues have told me that in order to get tenure and promotion, you need to be show you've published in international venues, which means American. And if you're doing work on Canadian issues, why do you want to publish in an American venue? Because it's considered now the big leagues, and we're somehow considered not to be the big leagues. And I've certainly heard that about the Canadian Anthropology Society meetings. It's like a good test for American graduate students. It's not really the big leagues. The American Anthropology Association is the big leagues. Are you good enough for that? And that's really undermining the discipline and the, and the prospects for the future for our students. I'm not saying that everyone needs to go into indigenous areas, but we need to really be spending time on saying our own institutions are important, valuable, have integrity, and we need to begin to start hiring more of our own people because we don't hire enough. That's what I wanted to say on that. Thank you for giving me that chance. <laughs> I have a few comments on that, but maybe we go through the other points. Okay, well, there's not much. The rest of it was, the rest of it's pretty easy, but I will do it if you have the time. I know. Yeah, yeah. well, it's... Uh, no, well, I mean, you guys have your... Well, we complete the sequence. So okay. It's good to do it. Okay, okay. Well, there were a couple of other things that I wanted to, to mention. So, okay, so just the last thing, so the ethics thing. 
Well, the ethics thing that I wrote about in that in that paper that that you saw and you wondered what I was talking about were was about the ethics of doing field work and the presumption that Boaz was doing this kind of ripping off salvage ethnography. And I said that wasn't the ethic within which he was working it. So it wasn't ethics in that other sense. It was the ethic. And he was not in that ethic. He was in an ethic that was political and trying to work out the humanity of these people, not to preserve their culture and let them die off. Okay, so that's that's all about that. Okay. So I wanted to mention that um, there are a number of things about salt tax that I didn't mention. So I just wanted to mention that when I went down to Oklahoma and worked with him with the Cherokee project that I'd mentioned yesterday, um, one of the wonderful things about Saul tax was that he was a great believer that the role of anthropology was very much in the service of the people that he would be working with. And he did a lot of work with indigenous peoples in the States to work, what are your problems? He wouldn't come in with any answers. He'd come in and work with them, what their problems were, material problems, and how, how he could deal with them. And that became sort of participatory action anthropology like 20 or 30, 40 years later. But even so, in participatory action anthropology, there's way more of the anthropologist saying, I'm the expert and I'm and I can help you with these things rather than being the person who says, What can I do to be helpful in this situation? And then figuring out how to get the expertise to be helpful. So I think that's 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 really important. Okay. Then Um, I wanted to quickly mention that when I went, Margaret and I went to the North in 68, one of the things, 69, the, one of the things that was really crucial was that um, New York at that time, we had just been through the business at Columbia, um, which was like Paris in 68, same kind of thing. Um, and... Um, the city was angry. New York was very angry. And it was hard for people like us because the people who were in favor of the war in Vietnam really spent a lot of time going after people like us. And we were happy to get out of New York. And the thing is that when we got to the north and we got to this little community of Wrigley, it wasn't like the imaginary that you had when you went to graduate school about, oh gosh, you live with the Indians and it's all going to be terrible and there's going to be these. Compared to living in New York, it was lovely. And there weren't pathologies like, like you imagine and uh, it was a very positive experience. The whole thing was a very positive experience. Okay, last thing, whether it's this whole card or not okay at the beginning of my career and I don't know if it's true for Harvey he's the person I keep in my mind as my reference person but he he got his degree a little bit later than me but at the beginning of my career when when almost at the beginning when I the Dene asked me to come to a meeting and we were going to talk about stopping the Mackenzie Valley pipeline and I decided I was going to do I was going to work on that, right? So the, at that very beginning of my, of the career, which is early 1970s, the only person who was doing that kind of work that I was aware of, and maybe it was, was Dick Salisbury. And he was doing that work in, in Quebec with the James Bay Cree. And I'm not, just to give people the idea of the difference, not to make a comment on better or worse, but the difference, Salisbury was convinced that you had to be objective in your research. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that meant, and I still don't know, but 
A lot of people say that. It's a very common thing. You can't be an anthropologist, and as I said yesterday, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an activist. So you can't be an anthropologist and an activist. So how, that's the normal way of thinking about it. You have to somehow be objective. And I don't know, as I say, I don't know what that means. But it looks to me like it meant something like, well, on the one hand, there's this, and on the other hand, there's that. And it's up to a policymaker to make a decision. I could not, I did not, my mind, my body, my spirit can't go like that. What my way of doing things, for better or worse, and it's on the record, is... I know, I have my own opinion. I'm not telling you what's right or wrong, but I have my own opinion about what's right or wrong. If, if I start doing work on something that I know is right, okay, that doesn't mean that I reshape, change, do anything. I will give you the best information, the most accurate information, which will end up justifying my position. If I can't justify my position at the end of it, I won't justify my position. The research has got to support what I say. I try not to be cherry-picking facts, but I think everybody does, because there are so many facts in the world that at the end of the day, you have to decide on the facts that you think are relevant to the, to the particular situation. So it's not that you're lying about the facts. And what I say is, I put mine up. Okay, now Frederick, you go and you put yours up. And they may turn out to be different, and that's fine. I learn from you, you learn from me, and we get a better picture. So that's more objective than trying, from my point of view, than trying to be the person who says, well, I'm going to figure out what, how, what Frederick would say if he was looking at it, or what the, the people I disagree with would say, would, would, would take as facts. Let's just make the best case without going to the point of denying the reality of things you disagree with. You have to accept that you're, you know, there's, there are things you disagree with, and if it changes your opinion, it changes your opinion. Anyway, at the beginning of my career, that was very difficult sell, very difficult sell. I was really lucky because the I was able to publish an awful lot, um, and so I would I I could escape. Um, a lot of the criticism that, uh, of that because, you know, look, I have all these, I've done all this published in good places. I think now people are coming more to accept that that's really the best that anyone can do. So I hope so. But in any case, I wanted to say for those people out there who want to work in that way, it can have a lot of integrity but you've got to be honest with yourself with the information that you're looking at, and you've got to be open to finding out that maybe you're wrong and then having to revise what you have to say on the basis of the new information. What really is an ideologue is a person who refuses to accept things that don't fit their predisposed mind. But you always have a predisposed mind. Don't pretend you don't. So in that sense, I'm a rationalist rather than an empiricist, but that's who I am, and I think that it's a perfectly good way of being a researcher. Okay, thanks.